Jesus is alive, that he is not dead, that he is risen, amen? We get to celebrate that today, and our response is a loud hallelujah. Our response is a thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. You are alive, and because you are alive, we are alive. So let's sing this together. Let's sing hallelujah.
Christ. Amen. And amen. Man, it's so glad to see you here this morning, church. We're going to have an incredible day today. We're going to celebrate King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Why don't you grab your seats for a few moments? Hey, good morning, everyone. Welcome. Happy Easter to you. So grateful that you're here. We are here to worship the wonderful, beautiful, powerful name of Jesus. He has no rival, right? He has no equal. And why? Because of what he, um, what he defeated on the cross. His scars heal our scars. Uh, he, he died in our place for our sin. He canceled death. He made the devil powerless. Uh, and how do we know that? We know it because he burst forth from the tomb on Easter Sunday. And we are here to celebrate that and worship that. And you ought to do that right now again. Would you do that? Awesome. Hey, if you're new to Bear Creek or if we're new to one another, um, I'm David Welch. I serve as pastor at Bear Creek. And, and if you'll just look around, if you're new, if you'll just look around and see all of these faces around, around you, you know who they are? They, uh, this, is, this is a group of people who want to be your family. I mean, I'm serious. We're a, uh, we're a community, a faith community that just reaches into our community and cares for others. And, and the Lord just uses this place in an incredible way. And they want to be your family. And in fact, they want to welcome you into this place right now. Bear Creek, do that. Welcome those who are new. So if you are new, um, hey, if you want to grab that bulletin and just take a look, uh, there's a welcome slip there. And that's a really important uh, piece uh, of information because... It could just do some things for you, maybe in the minutes ahead or hours ahead or days uh, ahead. First of all, if you're new, I'd, we'd love it if you just fill this out and let us know you're here. And uh, by doing that, if you'll drop it off at one of the guest tables uh, out in the lobby, um, we've got some really great gifts for you, just sort of like housewarming, right? We want you uh, to be a part of our family, so grab that. One of the things in the gift um, is uh, uh, a Bible promise book. It's just got hundreds and hundreds of biblical promises for whatever you go through. And this could mean so much to your life. So it's in the bag. And so I would encourage you, as maybe someone new, fill out the slip and go get that. There's some other stuff in there, you know. I don't want to call it swag, but it's kind of swag. It's kind of. Uh, and so uh, maybe you want to do that. Also, uh, on the slip for anybody, whoever you are. If you walked into this place, you, had a, and you brought with you a burden, you brought with you a pressure, you brought with you a heartbreak, uh, and man, you, you just wish somebody would pray for you, you could take this slip and just share, just share your prayer need. And do the same, just drop it off at the guest area out uh, in the lobby. And I want to promise you, there are people in this fellowship who know God and love God, they believe in prayer, and they will lift you up. And so uh, I, would, I would invite you, I'd really invite you to do that. So um, um, we're going to come back and sing another song, really important song. It's really at the core of this service. It's just, it's called God Really Loves Us. I mean, that's it. God really loves us. And if I could just have one thing, I would want you to walk out of this place this Easter morning carrying, and that is just an absolute conviction, an absolute knowledge that you know that God really loves you. And so when we sing that, I hope that you'll attach to it. Hope you'll be in it. Then after that, I'm going to come and, and share an Easter message. It's called Easter Faith and Doubt. Easter Faith and Doubt. And that's going to launch a, a series over the next few weeks that's called Faith and Doubt, and it's just about the doubts we struggle with in regard to faith, and I hope you'd want to be a part of that. But before all that, we want to pray, and then I want to give you an opportunity to worship with an offering. Maybe you've come ready to just give an Easter offering, and I want to invite you to do that, so our ushers are going to come and get in place, and, 
And uh, you can give this morning either uh, using your device, just text the number that you see, you'll get a link, that's a secure link, and you can give uh, to the Lord that way, or grab one of the envelopes that's in your bulletin, and you can fill that out. If the bucket goes by too soon, we have giving receptacles just outside our doors, and you can put it in there. But let's worship. Let me ask, let's just bow, could we? Man, this is an important moment. Don't lose this moment. Man, I really want to encourage you to connect to your Creator in this moment. And just open yourself to the reality that He loves you. He really loves you. And God, I want to ask you in this moment, that you'll just speak into our lives. You know how we've prayed over and over and over, God, that your presence would just be so real, so manifest in this place, that, that it would be unmistakable to us that you're here and that you're seeking our hearts, that you're reaching into our hearts. And I just pray you help us lay ourselves open to you and let you speak into our lives. And We worship you now for how you love us. And we pray in Jesus' name, amen. than a brother There is no judgment Oh how he loves me I've got a friend And he is my strength And he is my portion With me in the valley With me in the fire With me in the storm
So on the first Easter, nobody was expecting a resurrection. In fact, all of Jesus' closest followers, they were all doubters. I mean, they were all doubters. I mean, as, bar- as embarrassing as that is, the gospel narratives make that plain and clear. Right, you get that, like, the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, before they were brought together to be a part of the New Testament, they were before that independent, independent records of the events around the life of Jesus, written before 70 A.D., probably maybe after 50 A.D. They're all written within 20 years of this event. And they write in the most embarrassing things, But they were eyewitness accounts, and they read like eyewitness uh, accounts. And and do you get that's a part? That's a part of the evidence of their authenticity. I mean, think about it. If If you were writing in order to create a movement, create a Messiah, create a movement to get people to follow, you wouldn't write in that the closest followers were abandoning that leader if you were the one writing it, but they did. You wouldn't write in that the final words of the Messiah dying on the cross was a shriek of, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But they did. And you wouldn't write in, this is a small, like, unusable uh, detail. You wouldn't write in multiple followers of Jesus bringing or purchasing embalming spices uh, in order to prepare the body to be in a tomb for a long, long time. But they did. The point is, uh, all of Jesus' closest followers were doubters. They doubted the resurrection. That is until after the events of early Sunday morning, three days after Jesus' body was put in a tomb. 
And, and, and this, is how, this is how they became convinced. Uh, the gospel account of John 20, it tells the story about how he began to reveal himself uh, after his resurrection. And so earlier in the passage, John 20, the very beginning of it, it opens with Mary Magdalene. Uh, she goes to the tomb where his body had been placed, and she's going there with some spices to embalm him. Now look, j just a few verses earlier, the Bible tells us that Joseph of Arimathea had already done that. In fact, he bought a huge amount, maybe up to 75 pounds worth. I mean, these people were not expecting a resurrection. So neither one of them knew what each other was doing. That's an evidence of authenticity. If, you, if you're just writing out the facts, there are these confusing things. This person doesn't know what that person uh, is doing. But Mary discovers the stone thrown off, thrown off the grave, off the tomb, thrown off of it, and his body missing. And so she runs to find Peter and John, and she tells them, look, here's her thinking. She thinks that their enemies have come and stolen his body, and she's deeply upset. And so Peter and John, they run. They run to the tomb. And again, one of those unusable facts that just show the authenticity of the writing, John points out that he outran Peter to the tomb. They go in, they find a burial shroud undisturbed, but the tomb empty. And they were totally confused by it. They didn't walk out overjoyed. They were dazed and confused. Because the possibility of resurrection was not entering their minds at all. But then, but then shortly after they arrive back to their safe house, the place they're hiding from the Jews, they think they're next, uh, their executions are next. Mary Magdalene burst into the room. She had stayed back uh, at the tomb. She burst into the room telling them that she's just seen Jesus. And then I pick it up in John 20, starting in verse 19. So listen to sacred scripture. The Bible says, then on the evening of that first day, later that day, the evening of the morning, they had just been to the tomb. When the disciples were together and the doors were locked for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. And after he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Now Thomas, called Didymus, Didymus means twin, he was a twin. One of the twelve was not with the disciples when Jesus came. Verse 25, so when other disciples told him, we have seen the Lord, he said to them, Unless I see the nail marks in his hands and put my fingers where the nails were and my hand into his side, I will not, I will not believe it. Verse 26, fast forward one week, the very next Sunday, his disciples were in the house again and Thomas was with them. And, and though the doors were locked, Jesus came and he stood among them and he said again, peace be with you. And then he said to Thomas, Put your finger here. See my hand. Reach out your hand and put it into my side. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said, my Lord and my God. Okay, take a breath here and give these guys a break, these men and women uh, a break. Look, honestly, they have been through uh, uh, some really ter terrifying hours. They watched they thought they were coming into Jerusalem for Jesus to declare himself a, a political Messiah and all of their hopes and dreams come crashing in and, and he's, he's arrested by a mob in the Garden of Gethsemane. They watch him carried away by that mob. They're terrified. They themselves run away for fear of their lives and then, and then they watch, they watch as he's viciously beaten and tortured and then executed on the cross. But then, now listen to this. This is the message. This is what you need to start absorbing. The way Jesus appeared to, him, uh, to them, the way he appeared to them after his resurrection reveals so much about how he wants to show up in your life. That's a big deal. 
So like maybe um, you're not a follower of Christ. Someone drug you here, right? Um, or maybe you sort of think of yourselves, of, well, I don't follow him anymore. Or maybe somewhere in the past, I don't know, you saw a two-minute TikTok clip where somebody poured out a lot of contempt on Jesus. I mean, they were just going for your clicks, but, but you let it influence you. And after that, you've just sort of said, yeah, I don't know about Jesus. I just want you to know there is a reality in Jesus. And the way he shows up for people around him that first Easter tells, tells you how he'll show up for you. And I want you to see that and feel that, experience that today. Watch this. The way he helped them is the way he can help you to see his reality, experience his reality. And let me just show you how he did it. First, first, he's he showed them, and so I'm going to put it in terms of you. He's showing you how. He shows them, and it's showing you how to confront your own doubts. Your own doubts about him. Your own doubts about the resurrection of Jesus. Verse 19, and Jesus came, and he stood among them. And so look, let's say it again. The story of the resurrection is, is full of eyewitnesses who were not expecting a resurrection and who were confused about it and slow to believe it. They were all doubters. Mary Magdalene went to the tomb, found it empty, and thought some people had come and stolen his body. Peter and John saw an empty tomb with burial cloths intact, and they went away from the tomb just dazed and sort of confused. Thomas Thomas gets all the reputation for being a doubter. Thomas is just the last in a long line of doubters that weekend. He was not there the first time that Jesus appeared. And even though, look, ten witnesses tell him, we saw him, he replies, not till I see him will I believe him. But look, you, listen, here's your point. You're getting it from eyewitnesses too. You're getting it from eyewitnesses too. It's just remo removed by more time than Thomas had it. Like, for instance, if you're thinking that the accounts of Matthew, Mark, Luke, John are like legends, scholars will tell you that this is not the way that ancient legends were written in the ancient world. I mean, uh, that brought on the conversion of C.S. Lewis uh, because his expertise was in ancient literature, and that's what troubled him about the New Testament so much is that people call them legends, but they're not written like legends. And if you think, well, 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 they, they were like, they wrote it like a novel. You know, lots of detail, unusable uh, stuff in, uh, in them, except that that literary genre, the novel, wasn't even invented until the 1700s. These are eyewitnesses telling you that they doubted, and then they were confused, and then they believed. And, and, and what they saw, and now listen, this is, this is the most convincing this is the most convincing evidence to me. What they saw transformed their lives. They gave up their, his closest followers all gave up their lives for what they witnessed over those three days. Most of them were martyred for, for what they saw that day. I mean, look, this is just a reality. Liars don't give up their lives for a lie that they know is a lie. But even more, this event began to deeply, fundamentally change a major ancient culture. Rodney Stark um, I think he's a Harvard professor. He's, he's written extensively about this because as a historian, he found, he found all of the explanations of the influence of Christianity inadequate. And so, he, so he, he did more than a decade of study of its influence. And what he found, what he found is that it began as an influence with no political power at all. And it was happening underneath the service, uh, surface before anyone at all could fully recognize it. I mean, from that moment, 
moment, suddenly, people by the hundreds, then by the thousands and hundreds of thousands, started becoming followers of Jesus. Why? His conclusion is because it was just so compelling. They brought fundamental transformation to the Roman Empire without having an ounce of political power. For example, they began these are just his examples, that they began saving lives of newborn baby girls that it was just typical to throw out just because they weren't wanted. And these, these believers of Christus from Galilee, they gather these babies and they raise them and take care of them. They began feeding the poor all around them. This was not done in, you, you feed people connected to you in the ancient Roman culture, you, might, you feed your family, you feed those clothes. You don't feed people who are not like you. And these, these people, they were feeding anyone who was hungry and going without themselves, going hungry. They began staying back during pandemics. Rather than fleeing, they stayed and cared for the sick, caring for people who hated them, giving their lives to care for them. I mean, this is the precursor of compassionate medical care. It had never been a phenomenon ever in history. And all the while being looked down upon and perse- persecuted for being followers of, of this Crestus from Galilee. And so, and so it burst, it, it, it slowly but then burst on the scene as this incredible culture-changing mo- movement without ever having a representative in the Roman Senate. But, but it's not just that. He's not just helping them confront their own doubts. That's one. But secondly, this is the most powerful. This is the most important. This is the one that should touch your life. And that is that he's showing you how much he loves. I mean by that he's showing you his capacity to love you. Man, I want you to know this and feel this. In verse 20, it says that he showed them his hands and his side. Verse 27, he says to Thomas, come here, Thomas. Give me your hand. Feel the scar tissue. I feel the the spear wound there. He was offering them evidence that he's real. And that his love is real. And so he showed them his wounds. And I cannot deny that something deeply motivated him to go through that for me. I think I've told you about this somewhere in the past, long ago. I don't know, and you know, long, long ago. But anyway, um, I heard about a kid in South Florida. True story about a kid in South Florida who jumped in some swampy water that he shouldn't have jumped into. His mother was just looking away for a moment. He jumped in. He should not have jumped in because nearly immediately an alligator latched on to the lower half of his legs. And so his mother heard the thrashing, heard her son scream. She turned and she flew into the water and grabbed her son by his arms and thus ensued an epic tug of war. I mean, the alligator is ten times stronger than that mom. But that mom held on to her young son, uh, her fingernails digging into his arms. And so the struggle went on for what she thought was forever. And, and, the, and the one who gave out first was the one who was ten times stronger. That was the alligator. She was not going to let go of him. He was in the hospital healing and He'd gone through his healing, and it became kind of a local story. Uh, and so, on. so uh, a reporter came to interview him, and, and they talked. And then, and then he, asked, he asked, hey, would you show me your scars? And so he lifted a pant leg, and you could see the, the, uh, the scars from the alligator. But, but, but with great pride, this little, boy, this little boy says to him, hey, wait, 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 but look, look at my arms. Look at my arms. I've got really great scars on my arms. I have them because my mother wouldn't let go. Yeah? You know what that is. You know what that is. That is a fierce lob that will not let go. 
She, he had those scars because of how much she loved him. Jesus has got great scars too. And they're on his hands. And they're on his feet. And they're on his side. Uh, but his scars are because he, he wouldn't let go of his love for you. And, and those are the marks, those are the marks of how much he loves you. I mean, the greatest thing that anyone has ever done for you is standing right in front of you. And that's Jesus. And he died for you in your place for your sins, for your weaknesses, all the broken places in you. And nobody, nobody has ever loved you like Jesus. And so the Bible says, God showed his great love for us, Romans 5, 8, by sending Christ to die for us while we were still sinners. Why does that make a difference? Why does that even make a difference? Here's why. Here is who you are at the core of who you are. You, I mean, I mean, if you were reduced down to what you are at your essence, the the bottom, the bottom foundational desire of your life, the bottom foundational ambition of your life, the bottom uh, foundational hope of your life, you long to be known completely and loved deeply. Known completely and at the same time loved deeply. And that describes Jesus for you. He knows you. He knows every cell in your body. He knows your heart and mind. He knows your best thoughts. He knows your weaknesses. He knows what's worst about you, and he loves you. You can't stop him from loving you. The greatest act of love, I think, the greatest act of love is to forgive someone who has wronged you. And the Bible says that we've all sinned against God, and we've wronged him by our rebellion toward him, by our turning away from him. All of our sin separates us from him. And Jesus comes to you on the cross, and he offers a love that brings forgiveness, and his scars are the proof of it. There's a last. And that is, this is how he shows up for them. This is how he helps them. It's in order for you to see how he comes to you, how he shows up for you. And the last is he's showing you how to believe. That's happening in verse 27, 28. He is there when Thomas is there. He appears when Thomas is there. And he says in verse 27, look, Thomas, put your finger here. See my hands. Reach out your hand and put it in my side. But here's the important thing that he had to say to Thomas. Look at it. Stop doubting and believe. And Thomas said to him, my Lord and my God. I mean, what Jesus the, the grammar, the grammar here, what Jesus literally says to, to Thomas is stop unbelieving and start believing. In, in other words, this is how you understand it. He's saying to Thomas, drop your conditions for believing in me. Drop all your conditions for believing in me. He's saying, look, if I'm real, And if you see me alive now, after I've been dead three days, why don't you just drop your conditions for believing in me and just believe in me? And maybe that's you too. Maybe your doubts have come from just not wanting to surrender to him what it would mean for him to lead your life. Maybe that's where your doubts have have come from. Maybe for you, your doubts have come from being wounded and Man, that's really tender, wounded by someone who called themselves a Christian. And so your condition is that you're never going to get hurt again by somebody who says they're a Christian, but they are not Christ. Would you drop your condition? Maybe your doubt comes from a disappointment that you felt like God didn't come through for you. I've struggled with that too. But I found, listen, after time, after time, I've discovered something. I found that actually it's belief and not disbelief that's been my answer. 
When I've been disappointed in something I've wanted God to do, but apparently God didn't do it, and that brought disappointment for me, I've actually discovered over the long, over the long arc, it's been belief, not disbelief, that's been my answer. I found that, that outcomes, that the outcomes of terrible things over time, God turned to my good. Because, not because I doubted, but because I was willing to believe. Because I put my trust in Him for an ultimate outcome. I've come to realize that God is loving me and working for my well-being even in some of the worst things that have happened in me. This is important. Most of the time, my doubts didn't need an answer. They needed healing. And I want you to know that you can come to Christ and still have some unanswered questions because I think you have enough to know him and to believe in him and to invite him into your life. And that is exactly what Thomas did. He fell down before him and said, my Lord and my God. And so how do you, how do you come to that very same point? Here's the last two minutes. How do you come to that same point? Romans 10 helps us with that. In fact, it, it, it answers that question directly. Look at it. Look at what Romans 10 says. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you will be saved, rescued spiritually, brought to him life into your, into your life. For it is by, verse 10, by believing in your heart that you're made right with God. It's just telling you how. And it is by confessing with your mouth that you're saved, that new life comes into you. And so look, there are three words here that you've just got to attach to. The first one is to believe, to believe. Believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead. That means that you come to, the, the word believe biblically means most of all to rely upon. It means that you come to rely upon, to believe. That's the truth. This supernatural thing that happened, this resurrection, I believe the evidence is there. I believe that it's true. But believe is also to embrace him with all of your heart. There's a second word, and that word is confess. To confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord. To confess with your mouth. That, that word means to agree with him. Agree with him that you need him. Confession is this incredibly humble thing to do, to say, I can't, I can't save myself from my own brokennesses and my own weaknesses. I've got to have God. That's confessing. But confessing is also turning to him. It's, it's living this life with no reference to God or rebellion to God. And to confess him is actually to reject all of that and turn to him and say, you are my answer. I confess you as Lord, the leader of my life, the source of my life. Last word, ask. That's two verses later. Everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I'm, in just one moment, I'm, I'm gonna pray with you, but I want you to think about this. I want you to be serious. In one moment, I'm gonna pray with you to give you this moment maybe to ask Christ into your life. So I'm gonna ask you to bow right now and Ever is going to come out, and it's going to be like one minute. He's going to sing over you. But I want you to use the one minute to just open your heart to him. And then I want to pray with you.
to open my eyes to see that you're shaping my life all I am and I surrender give me faith to trust what you say that you're good and your love is great I'm broken inside I give you my life oh. And I may be weak But your spirit's wrong in me My flesh may fail My God, you never Your spirit's strong in me, my flesh may fail, my God, you never will. Give me faith to trust what you say, that you're good and your love is great. I'm broken inside, I give you my are bowed and I want to I just want to speak into your life if you're a person who's never put your faith in Christ in the way I just described this is what the Bible says this is how you put your faith in him this is how eternal life comes into you this is how he begins to do the supernatural work in you and I'm just asking you if you've never done that or if you're not sure that you've ever done that I want to invite you to do it now. Now, there is a difference between just in your heart and mind thinking something that sounds like a good idea and actually engaging your will. And I'm asking you to engage your will. Decide in this moment. I'm asking you, have you ever asked Christ into your life? Or do you think you've never done that? If you've never done that, why don't you open your life to Him now? Ask Him in. If you're ready, pray with me. You pray silently. I'm going to pray out loud. But by your asking, this is you putting your faith in Him. So I'm going to pray it out loud, but use your own words, but I'm just helping you. Pray, dear Father in heaven, Thank you that you sent your son Jesus to die for me on the cross. That his scars could heal my scars. That his death would pay my penalty. That he would bring life into me. So I ask you, Jesus, I say to you, I believe in you and what you've done on the cross. And I ask for that to count for my life. That's where I'm putting my faith, that you forgive me, that you cleanse me, that you put new life in me. And I surrender my, I turn to you, and I surrender my life to you. Now, if you've been praying that with me, there's a promise God makes, and that is who ever, whosoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Our heads are still bowed. I want you to declare it. Our heads are bowed, but I want you to declare it. I just asked Christ into my life. Would you lift your hand and hold it up? This is showing me you've decided. You've decided to do it. I see them. Why don't you just keep, just lift your hands. Just lift your hands and say, right now, I've just prayed for Christ to come into my life. Just lift your hands and hold them up because I want you to like declare it. Lift your hands and hold them up. I see all of you. Father, I want to thank you for everyone who's just asked you into their lives and we praise your name for that and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you for joining us for our broadcast. This is so important. If you have never placed your faith in Christ, 
or you're not sure you have, I want to invite you to take this incredibly important step today. If you want to know how, do this. Find the link, bearcreek.church forward slash hope. It's bearcreek.church forward slash hope. Or text the word, just one word, BC Hope. It's BC Hope to 84576. And in about two minutes, I walk you through how to place your faith in Christ as the leader of your life. Honestly, it could be the most important two minutes of your life. Also, let me invite you to join us any Sunday in one of our four morning worship services. Check out our website, bearcreek.church, to find out more about our times and locations. God bless you. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope to see you soon.